Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continu- continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 9, where we left off last week. And you remember, the Lord has been on a high mountain. He has been transfigured before his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, the, the glory within him, the glory of his deity that is veiled in flesh, shone out. And he was magnificently transfigured. Well, now he's back. He comes down from the mountain. And we read, beginning in verse 14, When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, What are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, he grinds his teeth, and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And Jesus answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Last words are often important words and some of the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before his arrest are in John 15 when he told them, Apart from me, you can do nothing. That is the lesson of our passage. The lesson the disciples learned when Jesus returned from the mountaintop in transfiguration to find them unable to deliver a boy from the powers of darkness. Raphael, the great Renaissance artist, gave that lesson in his famous painting of the transfiguration, a painting on which he literally worked himself to death. It is um, two scenes, really, which give a contrast between light and shadows. At the top is the Lord in a circle of clouds and light. Moses and Elijah are with him, and the three disciples are at his feet. Below, in the foreground, in the darkness, is a boy suffering seizures. His father holds him helplessly while the defeated disciples vainly struggle to heal him. But one person in the crowd is is pointing up to the mountain and to the Savior, signaling where the help is. 
It is only in the power from above. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Failure is a great teacher. We all need it. Well, at least we need the lessons that it can teach us. Charles Spurgeon had some words on that. He wrote, If you don't get a blessing, it's because it's not safe for you to have one. And he explains that if God were to let us win a victory in an unhumble, self-confident spirit, we would squander our reward and we'd fall victim to the next great enemy that we encountered. So, Spurgeon said, you are kept low for your own safety. The disciples' failure was for their safety and instruction. It wasn't due to a lack of effort. It wasn't due to a lack of confidence. It's not that confidence is a bad thing. In fact, I think we all as Christians should live with great confidence. But the question is, what's our confidence in? And with them, they had confidence, but it was confidence in themselves. In fact, overconfidence. And as a result, they lacked faith in the Lord. That's what the Lord explained when he returned and found a crowd around them. Most in the crowd were disappointed by the disciples' failure. Others seemed to have been very pleased by it. Some scribes were there and arguing with the disciples. We assume from the situation uh, they were arguing in regard to the disciples' failure that uh, they use that failure in this discussion to challenge their authority and to say to the crowd around them that these men are frauds. They couldn't cast out this demon from this child. It seems, as you read through the Gospels, wherever Jesus was ministering or wherever his disciples were ministering, these teachers of the law were there to challenge the Lord, to challenge his disciples. That's characteristic of what it is for us to live in this world. The, the enemy is always there, the enemy is always active, and the enemy is always criticizing. And, of course, when we fail, they pounce on that, as these scribes did here. They were saying something to the effect, these men don't have the power of God. It's obvious from their failure here. But what they were doing, really, in questioning their authority and their ability, was imputing that failure to their master, to the Lord himself, and saying, he's not genuine. God's not with him. And that's when, unexpectedly, the Lord arrives. He always arrives on time and at the right time. And that's what he does here. He comes from the glory on the mountain to the grind below, where he exchanged the company and encouragement of Moses and Elijah for the attacks of the teachers of the law. And that, again, is life. That's life in the world for God's people. We want to follow Christ. We're going to meet this kind of challenge. And this is what the Lord had to come back to from the glories of that mountaintop to the conflict below. Well, his appearance, it seems, surprised the crowd. Mark says that when the people saw him, they were amazed, evidently, at his unexpected arrival. But again, he always arrives at the right time, and this was the right time. And when they saw him, Mark says, they immediately rushed to him. But his first response was not to greet the crowd, but to defend his disciples. He went straight to the scribes and he asked them what they were discussing with his disciples. And that's when a man in the crowd, the man most affected by the situation, the father of the boy, answered. He didn't answer the Lord's question directly about the argument that the scribes were making with his disciples. Instead, he gave the cause or occasion for this discussion, which was his son and his son's affliction. And the description that he gave of him was a sad one. He had many of the symptoms of severe epilepsy. But the cause of it was not medical, it wasn't genetic or uh, an electric storm in the brain. It was spiritual. It was demonic. That's what the father said. His son was possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. It also made him deaf. 
Those are not symptoms of epilepsy. A demon would unexpectedly, randomly seize him, causing violent convulsions, foaming at the mouth, involuntary gnashing of the teeth, rigidness followed by complete exhaustion. The spirit not only caused seizures and made the boy mute and deaf, it made repeated attempts to kill the boy by throwing him into a fire, throwing him into water. So this boy was not only covered with scars physically, but psychologically. He was terribly traumatized. This is the nature of Satan. This really gives us a window on, on him and on the world in which we live. He is a murderer. That's what Jesus said. He describes him that way in John chapter 8 and verse 44. And that is the purpose of demonic possession. The commentators have made that point. The, the, the point of the purpose of demonic possession is to mar and destroy man because man is made in God's image. And an attack on man and an attack on that image is an indirect attack on God himself. And that's really the point of all of this in this demonic attack on this child. It is to attack the Lord God as well. Attack his creation. Attack what he has done. This boy and his father were cruelly attacked and powerless to stop it. The boy's plight naturally touched the Lord and moved him to compassion. But he was also moved to grief when the man said he asked the disciples to help, but they were helpless. And so the Lord said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Unbelieving is how he describes the generation. And, and I think he is, in, in that statement, describing the characteristic of the entire generation. It was an unbelieving people that he was among. Uh, the father who had come believing in the Lord's ability now seems to have doubts. No doubt it's because the disciples couldn't do what he had hoped for them to do. But also he's been standing there listening to this discussion going on with the scribes and perhaps their arguments against these disciples has had some effect upon him as well. So when the Lord says this, uh, unbelieving generation, he's speaking of the generation as a whole. He's speaking of uh, this man, no doubt, with his doubts. But I think specifically, really, his statement is directed at his disciples. He's the main object of their rebuke. They had failed when they had every reason to succeed. Earlier, you remember, in chapter 6, he'd sent them out on a mission. And they had had great success. They'd healed the sick and they had driven out many demons. But here they failed. What happened? Well, that's what the disciples wondered. And what Jesus will explain to them later at the end in verse 29. Their defeat was due to a lack of faith. Their defeat was a failure to understand their complete dependence on the Lord. Now we can only guess what they had done while Jesus and three of the disciples were up on the mountain and they're down here struggling with this issue. They evidently had gone through some motions. They had given commands. Maybe they would even tried some of the formulas that the rabbis use in, in exorcism because we know from Acts 19 that, that rabbis practiced exorcism too. Maybe they uh, depended on all of that. What, what they didn't do was pray. <clears throat> Faith and prayer go together. We pray from a believing heart, knowing that God can supply our needs according to His will. According to His will. And they didn't pray. That comes out at the end of the passage explicitly. What happened, it seems, is their past success gave them a sense of self-confidence that resulted in spiritual neglect. 
Instead of looking to the Lord, they trusted in their own words. They trusted in their own techniques. They thought of their past success and took things on in their own power. But power doesn't come from techniques or formulas. Not, not the power of God. It comes from Him as we walk by faith and seek that power and seek that ability through prayer. The disciples didn't act from faith. Now they had personal faith. These are believing men. But the Lord's statement, O oh, unbelieving generation, indicates that here at this moment they appeared indistinguishable from the unregenerate world around them. And they appeared that way because they were following the world's methods, not living in dependence upon the Lord. It's, it's unexcusable, but not uncommon. In fact, I'd say it's very common. It, it, it's happened to God's people in every age. In fact, it, it happens to each and every one of us. We either draw upon the methods of the world or we simply fail to seek the Lord, look to Him. Men might do great deeds at one moment only to fail later. In fact, in the previous chapter, we have a great example of that in one of the disciples, in Peter, who answers the question, who do men say that I am and who do you think that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. The fuller answer is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a magnificent statement of faith. What a triumph of faith. Only in a few moments to fail when he tries to dissuade the Lord from going to the cross. From great faith to a failure of faith. There are many examples. One example that occurs to me and one of the better known examples in the Word of God is Samson. Samson, who became neglectful and lost his hair and his strength. He had had great success, done amazing things, miraculous things, defeating the enemy, killing the Philistines, triumphing over them. And then there's that moment in his weakness, in his neglect. He said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But the writer said, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. What a condition that is for so many of us. He didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. We can live with a sense of confidence and we take on a rather worldly approach to life and we don't realize the Lord's not with that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As a result, Samson became a grinder in the prison where the Philistines afflicted and mocked him. And here the disciples, having neglected the source of their strength, failed miserably, and now the scribes are there mocking them. And their failure to be distinguished from the world and failure to know, to look to the Lord after being with Him for so long, that failure exasperated our Lord. This is one of those examples we shouldn't miss because this is an example of His true humanity. He is the Son of God as this book states at the very beginning and as Peter confessed. He is the Son of God but He's the Son of Man as well. He's truly God. Very God of very God but He is a genuine man and He had emotions. And here, his true feelings, the feelings of a true man, come out in a rebuke. A rebuke they needed to hear. It, it, they are pure feelings. They are proper feelings. But because of their unbelief, he was vexed by them. And they needed to hear that. They needed to hear about their failure forcefully. And he gave that. But he understands us. He knows that we're just dust. And he doesn't give up on us. And he doesn't give up on situations. He doesn't leave things broken. He fixes things. He said, bring him to me. And when they did, when they brought this uh, 
young man to Jesus, he saw firsthand what the boy's father had described. The demon immediately threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Luke wrote that the demon slammed him to the ground and Luke used a word for that that's used of a, a wrestler slamming someone down and it shows the, the force of the violence used against the boy in a last attempt to kill him. It again shows the antipathy that exists between Christ and the demonic realm, the, the hatred that Satan has for Christ. Before Jesus said a word, the demon showed its power over the boy, and it seems that he shows this in a show of contempt toward Christ. Jesus naturally felt concerned for the boy, and he asked how long he had suffered from this, these horrific attacks. His father answered from childhood. Almost all of his life he's been the victim of this, this demon. And then in, in desperation the father cried out, If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And notice that, not help him, help us. That's apparent. One of the things I, I think we should never neglect and one of the subtleties, perhaps, of the Word of God is it's, it's realistic. It's true to life. That's one of the, the verifications of the reality, the truth of this book. It's, it, is, it fits with our experience. And right here we see that. Not help him, help us. This is a parent speaking. Our children don't suffer that we don't suffer as much or more with them. And this father who was, was helpless against the evil spirit was desperate, desperate. Help us. And Jesus would. But first he had to deal with the father's weakness, his lack of faith expressed in his statement, if you can, which suggested he thought, well, maybe he couldn't. So Jesus asked him about that and explained that all things are possible to him who believes. In other words, the issue is not whether Jesus is able. He's able. The issue is faith. Nothing is impossible for the person who believes. So he was asking, do you believe? Because all things are possible for those who do. Now, that, that's a striking statement. All things are possible. And I think the temptation of us is, as we read that, think about it, to, to qualify that phrase, all things, to the point that it, its scope is not quite so wide. We pare it down to something much smaller. But he intended them to take it at face value. These are, are words of encouragement intended to restrain our fears and strengthen our hearts and boost our faith. And men who have taken the Lord's words at face value and acted upon them have lived impressive lives. Lives of service and lives of accomplishment. One that comes to mind is, is William Carey called the father of modern missions. He was a man who set out from England as a young man and he and the group with him opened up India for the gospel and it was not an easy thing. It didn't happen easily or immediately. He spent his whole life there and, and struggled greatly but God blessed it. Well, Carey had a motto. It was expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And that's what he did and God blessed it. And here the Lord was telling the man to expect great things from God and not limit him. He was telling the man to overcome his doubt. Now that's the struggle, isn't it? That's the struggle that we have in life. It's the struggle we have in prayer. Doubt. The man answered immediately, Mark says, answered in a prayer that many Christians have prayed. I do believe Help my unbelief. Help me overcome it. It's an honest and an earnest prayer. 
We must believe. We must conquer our fear and doubt to believe. We do that by learning. We do that by knowing who God is. That's how we water our soul and help our faith grow. By learning the Word of God, the revelation that God has given. In fact, that's what Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. And so we need to be hearing the Word of God. Reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God continually because that is what strengthens our faith. And we need that because we live with this constant contradiction within us of having faith and doubt. But ultimately, ultimately it's not in us to do that. God gives the faith. The Lord will... We'll speak of that in the next chapter. He'll develop that with his disciples. <clears throat> and in, in making his request, this father acknowledged that. He acknowledged his inability to do this, to overcome his doubt, to strengthen his faith. Now, he was responsible. We're responsible. But he recognizes that ultimately that comes from the Lord. Help my unbelief, he says. That's the acknowledgement. I can't do this in my own strength. In fact, every time we pray, we're looking to the sovereignty of God to do what we cannot do for ourselves and know that He can. And the Lord did. He blessed the little bit of faith that He had and helped His Son. As the crowd gathered, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And it came out. After one last gasp effort to destroy the boy, it cried out and threw him into such violent convulsions that it appeared to the crowd that the boy was dead. He wasn't. We read in verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up. Matthew's account is shorter. He simply says, Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Luke tells us that the Lord returned him to his father, returned him to him whole and healthy. That and the whole incident here calls to mind the stanza in Luther's great hymn. I think we sang it a week or two ago. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Certainly see the hate of the evil one in all of this and our inability to stand against him in our own strength. The disciples learned that. We are not Satan's equal. He is such a powerful and cunning being that we cannot overthrow him, not in our own strength. But he is not too strong for the Lord. One little word shall fell him, Luther said. And Matthew's account brings that out. The power of Christ's word. Jesus rebuked him. That's it. One little word. Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him. And the boy was cured at once. It seems to have been an especially arrogant demon throwing this child down before Jesus almost as a kind of challenge and one little word he's gone and this child is cured at once the scars and fear and pain were removed and he was made whole and healthy and the disciples were helped in all of this they learned their inability But they still needed instruction, still didn't quite understand why they were so completely inadequate in their attempts to heal the boy. So when Jesus took them into a house away from the crowd, he began to ask, they began to ask him about this. Why could we not drive it out? And Jesus gives the answer in verse 29. And he said to them, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. So there's the problem. They weren't praying. They didn't pray. 
In Matthew, Jesus highlights the power of prayer by saying, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. Now, he was speaking hyperbolically there. He's exaggerating about the mountain. The Bible doesn't teach that we can go about uprooting mountains willy-nilly if we just believe hard enough. The point is, no difficulty is too great for those with sufficient faith. The, the equivalent to that is Mark's account here when Jesus said to the Father, all things are possible. When we walk by the Spirit, live by faith in God's Word and follow His will, seeking above all things to glorify Him, not gratify our flesh, then no obstacle can stand before us. The disciples were not following that path. Their faith was not sufficient because it was not persistent. They were depending on words and text techniques, not the Lord, not really. It is only through reliance on the Lord that we can do anything. We make contact with Him and maintain our relationship with Him through faith. We do that through the Word of God, through the study of it, but we communicate with Him in this way. Through faith, through prayer. The, the, the specific acts of faith that obtain His power for us is that very means of grace that He's given us, prayer. Now, even small faith in prayer is effective, like a mustard seed. And it grows with use. But that's the way to effectively overcome difficulties. Difficulties like demons can be hard. They, they require persistent prayer. We cannot give up after a short time. We must continue at it in prayer fervently. That's, that's the challenge, isn't it? Um, we can pray, but we sometimes give up soon after because we don't get an, an immediate answer. Persistent prayer is difficult, but that is the challenge of faith. And those who truly believe continue in that exercise of faith, continue praying, praying fervently. And this is a word of encouragement to us to do just that. Success comes through faith and faithful perseverance. And perseverance is an act of faith. And doing so according to God's word and will. Not according to our fantasies, not according to our imaginations, not according to simply our desires. It is praying and persevering in prayer according to God's word and God's will. We pray for something and we don't receive an answer. It may be because, well, we're praying for the wrong thing. We're not praying for what is according to God's will. And what God gives us according to His will is always the best thing for us. So it may be that we're not praying according to His will, or we're, it's just his, not His time to give it. And we need to continue in that. Continue praying. What we need to do, though, in all of this is recognize our powerlessness. That's the reason failure is a good teacher. Uh, we don't want failure. But it is beneficial when it teaches us what we lack and what we need. The boy's father had a healthy understanding of his inadequacy when he said to Jesus, I do believe, help my unbelief. That's a good prayer for all of us, continually. Look to the Lord, because apart from Him, we can do nothing. But through Him, we can do a lot. We can move mountains. Those in our heart. Those in our way. And the case of this possessed boy is proof that no condition is hopeless for Christ. There are many strong passions that enslave people, from alcohol to drugs to pornography to worldliness, greed. They destroy lives. 
and people are helpless to deliver themselves from them. How many parents have watched a son or daughter go down one of these dark paths and have felt helpless to fix the problem and are helpless like that boy's father but there is something that can be done the same thing the father of that boy did he brought his child to Christ and parents can do that for their son and daughter by going to the Lord in prayer and crying out to him about their child Prayer is real. It is the effective means we have to gain help. The Lord hears our prayers. And in His time and in His way, He answers. But again, that may require long periods of prayer, years of praying, which again requires perseverance, which is faith. It's the exercise of faith. But the Lord promises to give help to all who draw near to the throne of grace and seek help in time of need. That's the promise. That's the exhortation of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. That's what we're to do. We're to do that for all of our needs and all of our concerns. Paul told the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That's how we're to live our lives. We must look to the Lord always. Look to the Lord for others, for their needs, for their help, and for ourselves. The disciples learned that through their failure. We will always stumble in our Christian walk when we take our eyes off Christ and try to live in our own strength, do things with other methods, the ways of the world or the ways of our, uh, 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 of our own kind of wisdom or when we're seeking our own ends, that will fail because we are powerless. But He's powerful. And as we trust Him, He will give us ability to do what we cannot do in our own strength. And that, I think, is the great lesson in all of this. There are other lessons from this that uh, give both encouragement and warning Warning, because the, the incident gives a glimpse into the real nature of the world in which we live. What, what is so appealing about life, and there's so much about this world that is appealing, that, that, that really gets a hold of us. And not all of it's bad. A lot of it's fine, good, acceptable. But it can gain a real foothold in our life. What is appealing, though, about this world is all on the surface. There is a dark underside to this world, this fallen world. Satan is its prince. Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Paul called him the god of this world. He has power that we in our own strength cannot prevail over. Power of persuasion. He, he appears, Paul says, as an angel of light. And he can draw people in. And in drawing people in, he can draw them to destruction. John calls him the evil one. And we are subject to his allure from an early age. He doesn't wait till we're young adults to begin to appeal to us. The miseries of this young man began in childhood. So parents can't begin early enough to teach their children the Word of God, to train them in the light, not just warn them of the darkness and the dangers of it, but to, to show them the glory and the love of the Lord. But the warning here is broader than that. It's, it's for all of us, not just against the allure of the world and, and its call to us to follow, but the danger of neglecting the Lord, of simply failing to understand that we need Him moment by moment, failing as the disciples did. Now, they were, they were doing the work of the Lord, they thought. They thought they were being attentive, but they really weren't. They were failing to really look upon the Lord. We can so subtly 
fail to depend on Him and think we're doing the right thing when we're really not. We need to be constantly looking to Him. The Christian life is that kind of life. The Christian life is a life of faith. It's not a life of periodic faith. It's a life of continual faith. We always need to be living and walking by faith. But our faith and the reality is this is this, that our faith is mixed with doubt. Perfection does not exist this side of the grave. So we need to recognize that. We need to recognize the problem. Identify the problem. Be careful and seek God's help. The boy's father cried out, help us. And that's what we need to. We need help constantly. Help my unbelief. Help me overcome it. We expand our little faith by using it. By studying Scripture, by, by learning about the Lord, about His character, about His promises, and as we learn about it, we believe it more firmly. We must do that. And then by obeying Him. We grow in faith as we act in faith, as we act upon the things that we have learned. And we, we shrink our unbelief by resisting it, by recognizing it and praying against it. We take it to Christ, and we take all our weaknesses to Him and ask Him to empower us. Again, apart from Him, we can do nothing. He's the source of all strength and wisdom. And the events of this passage remind us how we need to keep our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of faith. And we have the assurance that all things are possible. Prayer is, is not some empty exercise. It, it's the real means of, of, of getting access to God's power, getting His blessing and overcoming temptation. We need to believe that. And we need to look to Him. In John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, the Apostle John wrote that the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. The devil's works are sin. The devil's works are unbelief. The devil's works are doubt. The devil's works are the things that we've seen in this passage. Destruction, cruelty, ruin, waste. That's the work of the devil. He's not creative, he's destructive. Christ is mighty to save. He has saved every believer from the grasp of the evil one. You want to know what you've been saved from? Well, one thing is from what we see in this passage. That kind of being, that person, you have been delivered from that cruelty. And John wrote later on in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies in His power. What a terrifying place to be. Again, consider what He did to that young man, that child. That's the nature of this world and the nature of the prince of this world. And He saves us from that. He saves, it from, saves us from it and He rebuilds us. He, he gave that boy back to his father, as Matthew said, cured. And He is continually curing and sanctifying us right now and He will do that to the end. He will never give up on us. He, he never gives up on us and He never gives up on a situation. And He continues to deal with us daily to the end. Even though we fail, He doesn't. And He will make us perfect. He's going to complete His work. Mark may have been suggesting that when he wrote of how Jesus raised the boy after saving him when he appeared to all that were there to be dead. And that's what he'll do for us. And, and this little picture of him raising up that boy from the appearance of death reminds us of that. By his death we are forgiven and by his life we will be resurrected. That's our hope. In uh, the book of uh, Colossians, Paul speaks of the mystery. Christ in us, the hope of glory, 
That's the hope that every believer in Jesus Christ has. And we will experience that someday when He physically, bodily raises us from the dead. What a blessing. What a great truth to, to have. So do you have the forgiveness of sins? Have you believed in Christ and, and laid hold of His sacrifice? Or are you in unbelief and are you still of this world? and in the power of the evil one. Again, I say that is a terrible place to be. He is a cruel ruler. He is a false god. His promises are lies and his power is for destruction and he will destroy you. So flee all of that. Flee from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Flee to Christ. Trust in Him. Even with the small faith that you may have, faith the size of a mustard seed, it's sufficient to lay hold of the work of Christ and the work of Christ transforms us. It gains forgiveness for everyone who believes at the moment of faith and secures you for all eternity. May God help you to look to Him, help you to believe in Him and trust in Him. Father, we thank you for your Son. He is a merciful, wonderful Savior. We give you thanks for the salvation we have in Him. Make us men and women of prayer more than we are, and we might serve you faithfully and bring glory to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.